Okay, um, my name's Colin. I'm from Microsoft Research in Cambridge. I'm just going to start with a bit of a story because I think it's a, it's a kind of interesting case of open source being quite a win, so this is the kind of conference for it. So a few years ago, one of my colleagues came to me and explained, to, explained that he was a bit sad. Uh, I was a bit worried because he programs in Python and we mostly program in .NET and I thought maybe he's not getting on with types and the language and this would be challenging because uh, working with the rest of my colleagues. But it actually turns out his issue was it was kind of a way of working because as well as programming, He's also primarily a scientist. And one of the things he used a lot is IPython notebooks. And so rather than it being a language, it was a way of working. And so we, we went into the search, and we fortunately found out on the kind of healthy open source ecosystem in .NET, there was a project called IF Sharp, which this was a project that was taking the F Sharp language and making it available in what is now called Jupyter Notebooks. At the time, it was more exclusively focused on Python. But there's been a kind of a refactoring and rejigging of the community, so that a lot more languages. And so, uh, after quite a long story, and I very much appreciate the people who made this available, I, I've now ended up as one of the, the primary maintainers of this library, which means you can give back to the community as well. And so, what was, my, what was my colleague talking about? Like, what kind of things did he want to do? Um, and so, this notebook system is a way of creating kind of interplay between text and description, uh, data and the code that you might operate on it. Now, why might that be important? Now, especially in a kind of uh, scientific community or an explanation community, so for education, then you really want to uh, enable the explanations for what's happening to go alongside the code, because it helps you with keeping it working. It helps you with uh, being able to share it with your colleagues. So another person I work with is a guy called Ben Hall at Cambridge, and he teaches undergraduates. And one of the things he's doing is teaching like how to model uh, Brownian motion in bacterial cells and how they move about. And so he's built a notebook using the uh, F-sharp notebook system. And we've got here like some text, uh, which you can edit in Markdown. But as well, he has some F-sharp down at the bottom here. Uh, so what he's doing here is starting to set up the units, the system, the, the things he's going to work with to provide an implementation so he can run simulations over this. But it's all in an environment together. And just to show that then, you can jump to the markdown form of that, as well as seeing the rendered text. All the details of this is like, uh, I don't want you to worry about. Uh, it's more that if you have some explanation that you want to pass along with the code, you could put it in text, uh, but it then might be quite hard if, as Ben's doing here, you want to write some LaTeX and you want fully rendered mathematics, which is what you can get back to. So you can have this form where you're seeing the results, as well as a convenient editing environment. Now, we go even further as well. So as well as the code, and the explanation, he's also able to run a simulation in the notebook environment and then visualize the results. And this really helps for, if you don't really know like, exactly what's happening with the data, or you want to explore or understand, this is a way to kind of, kind of interactive programming. And so this is, it goes a even further. I just have to mention, this is from the Python space, but uh, there's an IPython notebook from the gravity wave experiments where not only do they have some output, They've actually an output, output as a sound from some of the analysis. And as the notes are saying, you put on headphones, and if this was a real notebook, you could click it, and there's a little bump in the middle there which you can listen to. And it's kind of cool to be able to take like, cutting-edge research, take their data and understanding, and have a form that you can easily reproduce, which often isn't the case with a lot of scientific software. And here's another example of like, moving into the community as well. There's a, another person I work with uh, remotely on so-called probabilistic programming. So this is taking F-sharp and a very useful library called for differential programming. So, and one here as well. So this is some of uh, my own research that I work with scientists on understanding uh, stem cells in mice and in the future in humans as well. And so again, what we're doing is mixing these explanations, these models, these codes that's available, and then the renderings of those. Now, this is a very cool example of very recently that not only are you producing static outputs, uh, but there's a guy called Jason Pederis, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, who's taken the CNTK deep learning toolkit and put it into an environment where you can model, explore, and clean the data. But he's also used a new feature for asynchronous programming. So this is a bit like async in both C Sharp and uh, TypeScript. But F Sharp's got a slightly different take on it. Um, and we're building this sequence, and then we're rendering it through to the front end. So you're able to see your deep learning model training as you're running. Now, obviously, at some point, you want to scale up to a lot more GPUs on clouds or, or elsewhere. But when you're doing that initial stage of seeing if the model is like, feasible, it's really useful to get rapid feedback. OK, so fully open source project. Um, <coughs> runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. I'm running it on Mac here. Just uh, uh, 
one of the places. And what I want to do is show you a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, a lot of this I'm not going to run in too much detail because I don't want to rely on the Wi-Fi and some of its fetching external packages. But I've provided like a whole series of samples, and these samples are up and available and accessible, so you can search and run these yourself as well. Uh, so just to get started, so Chris covered earlier like some basics of F-sharp, but just to show you uh, some of the things you can kind of do. So you're writing F-sharp here, uh, and this is, these are the outputs immediately afterwards. So it's taking the last expression and printing it out. It's not super exciting, uh, but just to show that the system's basically working. Uh, so we've got a more detailed uh, uh, samples as well. And again, what we're doing here is providing our links to more information, but then giving people context with the code. So it's really useful as a kind of getting started environment. So it gives you some context. Uh, and just to demonstrate that this isn't all fakery, if I alter this slightly, uh, we get a much different number. And so one way to think about this, and so from people with a programming perspective, is that there's a, uh, a kind of uh, REPL underneath this. And so we are actually literally using the F-sharp uh, interactive service, and so people are familiar with C-sharp. There's a similar one there now as well. Or it's just kind of equivalent to the, like, your browser console. Now, we're using uh, quite... Uh, convenient uh, library that was made available, which is the F-sharp compiler services. So this idea of F-sharp as a service. And so what we're doing is we're taking this code at the front end, we're piping it over uh, ZMQ, uh, the .NET implementation, from the front end to a server. It's taking that code, compiling it, and executing it on the fly. Now, the reason why that's important is that as we're a REPL, then you have state underneath this as well. So when you, when you get a single uh, output back, we're not just throwing everything away. So we've got some code here, and it's a very trivial function again. But in the other cells, you still have that same context. So there's, there's a system running underneath. So you can build up interesting data or things that take perhaps a, a kind of non-trivial amount of time to execute and then work with them in a different way. So if you compare it to having to write scripts, this allows you to this much more exploratory, interactive approach. And so there's a whole series of things here, like just kind of getting started with F Sharp. Um, which all this is available if, if, you, if you wanted to as a way of learning. This is an example of using these uh, kind of units of measure, which allows you to tag information into uh, the numbers you're passing around. This is the kind of thing that if, if different people use this, less rockets would crash into Mars uh, because we wouldn't have so many unit mix-ups. And so, okay, that's all the basics. Like, you could, you could do this in a lot of environments. It's not much different from a kind of classical REPL. Once it starts, where it starts getting interesting is if you want to start using uh, uh, additional external code. Um, so not only can you uh, use libraries that are kind of built into the compiler, you might also have your own, your own setup. So what I'm doing here is basically trying to access a bit of the .NET framework. Uh, it's not currently referenced. So as well as giving syntax highlighting, we're actually giving kind of full error completion in here. So you can actually start referencing uh, extra DLLs so you have more functionality. What I'm going to do, though, is rather than doing it kind of this ad hoc way of pointing to your local DLL, some library that you've made, then it's, it's really useful to be able to pull in libraries from NuGet. And so this is a package manager called Packet. It's kind of a front-end client around NuGet. And we've brought it into here with a bit of a small DSL. So what we're saying here is if we pull in the library FSLab, which is a series of kind of scientifically useful libraries, a bit analogous to MATLAB, and what we're doing here is specifying the version, because like, being precise about what we're depending on so my demos won't blow up. Um, what we've done is we can then pull down that library. Um, but just to show you like, the stuff underneath, like pull back the layer a little bit, it's just all F-sharp code in here. It's, it's just showing you, basically, um, we can build up these layers, and we could use this externally. So things that you prototyped in a notebook, uh, when you're say some data scientists that you work with showed some working algorithm, it'd be much easier to move it out of here than if, say, you have been working in MATLAB or another kind of rapid prototyping or statistics environment. And so we've pulled in this library, and what we can start doing is I'm going to just code in some, like, a really simple example. So what this is showing is uh, a series of dates and values, and this might be a time series, maybe it comes from an instrument. And when you run this, it automatically takes the last expression, and what this is doing is formatting it out here. This isn't very convenient. It's not really useful for a lot of people to look at 
and help them understand. And so what we can do, and this is a feature that's worked on by some of our uh, collaborators at, in Moscow State University, a uh, uh, program called Lucy, she's made it so that you can also use this to uh, ask Packet to bring you down some uh, code from GitHub. So there's a repository by somebody in the community who's built some extensions. And what you could do is go and like, uh, manually download those F-sharp files yourself, put them on the disk, but then you've got to worry about paths and locations and keeping things up to date. And I should mention, just while I'm here, then you can pin it to an exact version. Uh, what I'm running here is it's literally get, it would literally pull down the version on GitHub. Somebody could change it underneath your feet, and uh, uh, surprising things might happen. But what you're then able to do is you pull down this file from GitHub. You can then load it on the fly into the interactive uh, environment using this. So we're looking into the packet files, and that's the package manager that's brought down this. Then we're able to uh, load up that formatting uh, code. And what it's done is registered itself with the Jupyter Notebook system and said, when you have types that look like the outputs of that data, instead substitute in this extra code. Now, a lot of that's written in JavaScript um, because this front end is primarily a web browser and that's a, a good way to get it done. But you're shielded from that. So one person can build a visualizer and then other people can start making use of it. And so... Similarly, uh, you might not want to uh, hard code in your data, as I've demonstrated here. You might uh, have some CSV files. And so this is a, a library uh, for data frames, and that's quite a convenient way of working with gridded data, uh, that it'll automatically read out things like uh, column headings. And so it's just warning here a little bit about, it claims we shouldn't use it from F-sharp, but it's totally fine. And if you pass in a little bit more information, it, 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 the warning will go away as well. So okay. We've got a way of pulling in external packages, useful functionality. We've got a way of customizing what we see and how it interacts. We want to make it a little bit more, uh, well, partly just a little bit more fancy. And so there's a very useful library uh, called Xplot. This is a, an F-sharp uh, or .NET in general uh, wrapper onto the uh, Plotly library, which is uh, written in JavaScript, but it's generally available. And it's also used in Python. Uh, and so what we can do is then open up this external library. And we've got this very kind of trivial example of uh, plotting some numbers. Um, one of the things just to highlight is, the, the, again, how convenient a lot of this is, that we've not had to do a lot of restructuring. We're just saying we're passing into this function that turns things into bar charts. We've got some customization. And then what you get out is actually a kind of fully interactive um, uh, visualization. And so uh, in this case, it's not too hard to see what these numbers are. But you can also uh, move around uh, in this environment and pull it up into the Plotly system as well if you wanted to do so. This is all running locally. You're not having to send your data to the remote servers, uh, which is very kindly made us available. Again, another uh, strong contribution and coordination in the open source space. And so one thing just to be aware of when you're working in this environment is that um, what I've done here is I, I've... I've I've copied it twice. Let's say you wanted two different charts. You want to look at them side by side. One, one of the things to be aware of is that what we're doing is pulling out the last expression. So what this, wo what this will do is when this second one is drawn, uh, it'll pull out that and plot that, but it'll discard the other one. So just a kind of thing to be aware of. You want, if you want to plot lots of things, if you want to kind of do I.O., you need to be saying push that out to the console or push it, push it out to the graphics context. And again... Uh, I think I've got this up. Yeah. So we don't want to we don't want to have this do an environment where you have to build everything from scratch because you then end up with a, and I've seen this happen a lot. One tool that's used by the scientist, one tool that's used by the programmers, and you have a very hard time transferring like uh, new analysis methods, new research into tools that you might make available externally. And so this uh, this is just the standard. Um, documentation. And this documentation was never written with anticipating being used in this kind of notebook context. But you can still take the examples that the people who've built here and drag them over into a notebook context. And so I'm not going to go over all this code in detail, uh, just because it's quite involved. But you're starting to get some quite rich visualizations. And if you start to think about how you might be able to make something like this available to like the uh, pe uh, people in your environment who would otherwise resort to writing R code or uh, other statistical environments, you might be able to collaborate more on the code to understand what's happening. And then you might be able to make those more easily available. And that's one of the things we found very, 
very helpful. So, try and check the time. Yeah. Okay. So, there's also uh, uh, the thing I'm showing here is just a Google chart. We don't in a sense, play favorites. We've added some helper libraries so that they can connect to the different uh, charting libraries, but Plotly and Google Charts. Now, I was saying about interactive charts. Um, now, it's very static there. You can hover over it, so in a sense, it's interactive in that uh, you've got all the information there. You can see it in different ways. There's also a charting library called Interactive Data Display by some of our collaborators. And I'm now actually going to run some real code and hope... <laughs> And so what this is doing is streaming values from your server. So uh, very similar to the example I was talking about earlier with the CNTK training. This is taking values, um, and that process is asynchronously streaming them over to the, to the uh, browser client. So you can imagine situations where you've got some long-running computation and you want to see what's happening. You want to go to feel for whether it's converging in the, uh, to the right place. And this is a, a general piece of technology that people can use in a lot of interesting ways. Okay. Now, uh, for those of you who heard Chris's talk earlier, then he, man he mentioned a, uh, a feature of F Sharp uh, called uh, Type Providers, which are magic. So what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of, uh, of these working. So also in the, uh, there's a library called F Sharp Data. And what this allows you to do is treat the data as something you feed into the a kind of compilation process. And the reason why this might be useful is that you might want to do things like code completion against things that exist in your database without some poor person having to write a huge layer in between. Uh, and so what we can do here is we can go to the World Bank, which makes this freely available data, um, and we can, we can just treat it as XML. So we can put in the URL, and we say, we're working with XML, and it'll pull it all down here, and then we've got this whole mass of stuff and then somebody's job is to go through this, uh, find out some signal from it. You have to write some code, go back and forth. But they've also provided a, a, a type provider. And what this is allowing us to do is to say, just get the context, the, uh, the World Bank data. And then I want to be able to write uh, F-sharp code in this environment without having to have somebody do um, some kind of script to generate the F-sharp code or somebody having to write all that code by hand. And so it's a bit like code generation at compilation time. So you don't have huge uh, reams of code on the disk that have to be very careful with. And it's also, in general, updated every so often. Now, I'm not going to... I, I can't demonstrate this easily because it takes a few seconds. I don't want to rely on the Wi-Fi. It'll all come down crashing. Um, in general, if you're on a reasonable network connection and you're not being watched by lots of people, it's totally fine. Um, but the interesting thing as well is that um, not only... Uh, do, can you do completion uh, at design time, so when you're writing the code? You can have these things that don't really look like methods. So uh, f -sharp has this syntax of double back graves um, to let you uh, put like, longer sentences in. And so they've made this more readable. Now, they could just mash it down, but this, again, it's for a different audience than people who primarily think of themselves as programmers. Um, and this allows you, and I, I've done this with some of our own like, research, uh, uh, pulling down off data storage and pushing it through to an API that people can then work with. And again, it's a little bit like if people who are at the kind of gaming scripting talk earlier. It's giving a set of people who are a different set of skills uh, the ability to work with the engines and tools that you're building so that you don't have to like, provide a lot of the scaffolding uh, and they have skills that the programmers don't. And so you can work through it uh, and start to chart, again, with the similar libraries to earlier. So this is just... Uh, showing uh, changes in uh, the amount of trade that's going on uh, for Belgium. Uh, but there's also other things you might want to visualize. It's like, can I get a sense of this from a kind of, on the, a kind of global perspective? Now, this, is, again, is a lot of stuff that you go into a, a data processing environment. People are often surprised. Like, they think there's magic machine learning where people spend all their time. But there's actually this whole section of time when people have to reshape and restructure the data, which we've got a whole set of libraries. And because the type provider has pulled in that structure, which is quite detailed. It gives you um, the ability to pick apart that data with type and safety. So what, what normally you would do is probably put identifier names, and then it would run, and if the data gets restructured or somebody adds a new record in a way that they shouldn't, you'd get runtime blow-ups, which would be unfortunate. This way, you get a lot more confidence that 
you're working with the structure itself as pushed into your compiler. I won't go over the details of this. Again, uh, the notebooks are all up available if anybody's curious how to do this restructuring. But one of the other map types that uh, Plotly makes available is this kind of worldwide map. And again, it's all very interactive. So what this is showing is the change in export over time. So as countries have moved towards doing more exports. Uh, now, this is the first uh, 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 record from the start of the years. And then there's another map down here, which is later. Now, you look at them both. They're both quite beige. There's differences. You could see eye to eye. But again, when, you, when you're trying to tell uh, stories or communicate things, you often have something in mind. And so what I've done here is taken the first record and the last record and let it show the difference between them. And so this is the type of thing that you could write a fairly short amount of code, and if you did it in the context of some business-relevant problem, then you might be able to make this available to people who are, care about these kind of outputs as well. Um, OK. And again, all this stuff is like external libraries that we've wrapped up into a .NET context, made available, uh, made a convenient, safe API. OK. I did mention machine learning and passing. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's quite a nice uh, statistics library called Accord. Uh, it's relatively straightforward and it all runs locally. Um, I'm just going to show it in quickly in passing because I think it, it talks to a little bit of the, the question of uh, interactivity. So imagine the kind of task where you're trying to detect faces in this, and the library has an ability to uh, a pre trained model. And what we can do here is we can run them. We can run it through, and like with an initial configuration, you get all sorts of like faces everywhere. Anybody's familiar with this uh, series? Um, uh, maybe not surprised there's faces everywhere. But what you can do is then work interactively, adjust the models, uh, and move it to getting closer to the right answer. Now, what you really want is a much more powerful library, and there are all sorts of uh, examples. I'm only going to show this much so far, but there's also some samples here of running with TensorFlow Sharp, so Miguel's library that he's worked on, uh, as well as PyTorch and also ML.NET. Um, but those are all in the samples, and they're all available. I'm just going to switch over and then wrap up. And so some people kind of think about this as like one, one side. Like people do one or two little notebooks. There's this uh, interesting observation that some of the folks at Netflix now run tens or hundreds of thousands of notebooks overnight. So they do this process. They have a data analyst uh, find some interesting signal, and then taking from their huge corpus of data that changes every night, They've built tools so they can run these automatically and then provide those like, freshly baked uh, analysis and visualizations so that people can go on and do further exploration. Uh, there's a, I think, yeah, I think I'll call it there. If anybody has any questions, there's a couple of minutes. Yeah? Is there any support for input widgets like you can with uh, Python notebooks? Yes. Uh, quite limited so far. Um, this, is, this is an active topic. Uh, but there's some issues on the tracker, uh, and if you wanted to get involved, uh, then <laughs> there's been some preliminary work. Any other questions? <laughs>